Is there going to be a real estate crash in Massachusetts like we saw in 2008? Time is gonna tell, but let's take a look at the data so we can make an educated prediction about the future of our real estate market rather than just throwing around some guesses while relying on national data. Hey, it's Jeff Chubb with the Chubb Homes Team. If you have any questions about your own specific situation or thinking about buying or selling a house, then you can find my information in the description below. I love talking real estate and would love to talk to you, a friend or a family member about your real estate goals. Now, the most important thing to remember when it comes to real estate is that real estate is local. So what's going on here in Massachusetts is quite frankly, it's different than what's going on in say California or Nevada. And what is going on in specific markets within our state is going to be different as well. So for example, what's going on at Brockton might just be a little bit different than what's going on in say Marblehead. To figure out where we're headed, first let's take a look at our past, specifically data on the 2008 real estate crash. Now the average home sale price in Massachusetts in 2005 was $434,095. It would dip slightly in 2006 to $430,000, then go up slightly in 2007 to a hit or under $432,000 to hit its low point actually in 2009 at $359,443. It would then rebound in 2010 with an average sale price in Massachusetts of $381,000. So that would be a little bit more than a 17% drop in home prices from the peak in 2005 to the low point in 2009. Let's also keep in mind that this was the worst recession since the Great Depression and a housing cause recession at that. Now all markets are based on supply and demand. So when supply goes up and demand goes down, well, then that's where you see price corrections. Let's first take a look at inventory levels leading up and during this time period. Now, in 2005, the average amount of homes on the market in the state of Massachusetts was 19,076 units. This would go up to 26,817 units in 2006, then hit a peak of 27,203 units in 2007, and then the inventory started retreating down to 25,000 units in 2008, and then down to 20,000 units in 2009. This means that inventory increased by nearly 40 3% from the year 2005 to 2007. Meanwhile, for sales, we saw 47,368 single family homes close in 2005. Then it went down to a hair under 41,000 units in 2006. And then a, that was a pretty large decrease in sales where in those two years, two years, it actually correlates to the amount of increased inventory. So sales actually went down 6,500 units while we actually saw inventory go up about 7,700 units year over year. Now in 2007, we'd see another minor correction uh, in sales down to 39,668. And then we saw another decrease in sales in 2008 coming in at 34,664 units sold. From the peak to the low point, we saw a 27% decrease in the number of sales in Massachusetts. So inventory is up 43%, sales were down 27. We have three different types of markets in order to figure out what type of market we're in. We use a metric called months of inventory. An equal market where neither buying nor, buyer nor seller has pricing advantage is between five to seven months of inventory. A seller's market where the seller has pricing power is from zero to five months and a buyer's market when a buyer actually has pricing power is anything, between, anything more than seven months. Now in 2005, we had 4.83 months of inventory on the market. And this is compared to the peak of 8.87 months of inventory that we had in 2008. Think of months of inventory as kind of a temperature gauge of the market and thereby home pricing. The lower the number of the months, the hotter the market. The more months on the market, well, the colder the market. So that's where we were in the past. Now let's take a look at where we actually are today. If I was gonna be the biggest pessimist and bear in the real estate market, the number one market metric that I would be pointing to is the affordability index for a buyer here in Massachusetts. Homes, they've gotten expensive. And while getting more expensive, they've actually outpaced the wage growth in our area. It's called the home price to earnings ratio. Now the average price to earnings ratio in Boston has been seven and a half times. In other words, a house costs seven and a half times more than the average person made in a year. And when they started keeping track of this data back in 2011, it was 6.7 times. 
Today, based off of this data, home prices are at 9.3 times higher than the annual average earnings. Now take a look at Worcester, where the average is 6.2 times. We were at 7.6 times in 2007, then jumped down below the average line, only to go back above the average from 2014 to 2016. Then we dipped below again to begin to spike in the fall of 2020 to shoot up to 7.6 times today. Hmm, I wonder what could have caused this spike back in 2020, right? I also think it's important to note that the time period from 2016 to essentially the summer of 2020, because this will be very important for later. Now, prices continue to increase, but the home price to earnings ratio continued to actually decrease. And this is because wages were increasing. As I mentioned earlier, if I was arguing on the side that housing prices were going to fall, then this would be the most important metric I would look at. This growth can't continue. People are literally being priced out of their homes right? If you aren't buying a house, then the way I see it is that you either have two choices. Either you're renting a house or living at your parents. Because living in a box that is rent free is just most likely not an option. There's no question that buying a house, it's gotten more expensive. But what about renting? Rental rates are going up as well. Some even use the term surging to describe rental rates. And this kind of makes sense since the cost to rent a property would be tied to, well, the price of that property and said carrying costs. Now, landlords will also look to keep rates up with inflation as their costs are going to continue to increase as well. According to apartmentsadvisor.com, the median rental price for a one bedroom apartment in the state of Massachusetts has gone up over 12% since March. Why are rates going up? Well, for one, because they can. Vacancies, they're at an all time lows. And two, because of inflation. These landlords, they know what's going on and will see an increase in the cost of their expenses. They also can read what's going on in the market and after many have taken it on the chin for the last couple of years, well, they're looking to make back a little of what they lost. The point is, yes, the price to buy a house is going up, but so are rental rates. The best way to say it is that all housing, it's actually all getting more expensive. You can't just look at one market and not factor in the other as most aren't planning on living on the couch of their parents in the basement. And the cardboard box, well, in Massachusetts, it gets really drafty in the winter. So as we identified in the 2008 downturn, one of the ingredients for a pricing correction is that you need supply to go up significantly. So let's take a look at our current supply of houses on the market, as well as some of the other factors that could really play into being a huge role in market supply. Now we currently have around 5,000 single family homes on the market in the state of Massachusetts. And as a reminder, we had on average 19,000 single family homes on the market in 2005. So we're at roughly sitting a quarter of the amount of supply available to buyers when compared in 2005 and less than a fifth compared to inventory levels in 2007. Yes, it's expected that inventory is going to increase. Not only do I expect it, I'm actually praying for it. But consider this, if we saw the same increases in inventory that we saw from 2005 to 2007, then that would be 5,000 units would be a little over 7,000 units. Inventory tripling would bring us to inventory levels that we quite frankly saw in 2013, which, is, uh, which was a really great year in the real estate world. Now, remember how we were talking about the market temperature gauge earlier with months of inventory, right? Today, we have less than one and a half months of inventory on the market in the state of Massachusetts. Again, this is compared to 4.83 months that we had in 2005. And to see the market that we saw in 2008, we had 8.87 months of inventory on the market. Then we would need to see months of inventory actually go up by nearly 600%. It's kind of like we were driving 150 miles an hour down the highway. The market has slowed and well, now we're going 130 miles an hour. This is all compared to us going 25 miles an hour back in 2008. We have a lot of slowing down to do before we can get to 130 down to 25 when we'd actually start seeing prices decreasing. So the question becomes, will the inventory levels double, triple or quadruple in the next couple of years or so? I love data, so let's look at some data. We continue to have limited supply in Massachusetts because, well, we can't really build that much more. At least not like you can in the other parts of the country like the South. 
This is a very established region in the country with limited amounts of land for housing expansion. This chart really shows how little building is being done in the New England region. Most of the building nationally is being done in the South. When you also look at single family and apartment permits from June 2021 to June 2022, then we see that in Boston, we had 17,045 permits for a population of nearly 2.8 million people. And this is compared to a similar size market like Phoenix that had 51,600 permits for a population of 2.3 million. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of cranes showing a lot of building in Boston, but it is nothing like we are seeing in other parts of the country. I think it's safe to say that we will not see any significant increases in inventory come from additional builder supply in our market. Now, a big driver of the market last go around was foreclosures and short sales. We actually call these distress sales. The mortgage real estate meltdown of the past was actually caused by a lot of risky loans with lower borrowing standards. We call these subprime mortgages. So what is different this time around? Well, the loans that banks have been giving to borrowers this go round have been a lot higher of quality. You can see that the amount of loans that banks have given for buyers with a credit score of 620 or below has gone down significantly. Since 2008, banks just, they haven't been lending uh, irresponsibly. There have been no ninja loans. Now the term ninja refers to no income, no job, no assets. That's right. People are actually able to get mortgages by stating their income and stating that they had a job and that they had these additional assets. This is how janitors were able to buy multiple houses on speculation. They just put a house under agreement that was about to be built and would sell it right when it was completed before they owed that first mortgage payment. That's exactly what speculation was. This all worked out great while the market was going up, but the second the market started to stagnate, and go down, well, that's when the house of cards fell. That is when the foreclosure crisis started and the tailspin began. Again, we don't have these systematic issues like we did last time. And Massachusetts actually currently ranks the 39th state for foreclosure activity, which is pretty impressive being that we're the 15th most populated state. Now, of the close to 3 million homes, 335 went to foreclosure in the month of June. The counties with the most foreclosure per housing unit from the highest to lowest were Hamden, Berkshire, Franklin, Plymouth, then Worcester. The other piece of data that points to whether a foreclosure crisis is gonna happen or not is that homeowners are sitting on a record amount of equity. While I, wouldn't find, well, I couldn't find any specific Massachusetts data on exactly how much home equity we're sitting on, I can tell you that as Americans, we're sitting on more than $3.8 trillion of equity. And that in the first quarter alone, Massachusetts homeowners, they picked up on average an additional $62,000 in equity gains. Massachusetts homeowners are sitting on a lot of equity. Currently only one and a half percent of Massachusetts homeowners are in a negative equity situation where they actually owe more than their house is worth. And I feel comfortable in saying that I don't see inventory levels really increasing to an amount where we are tripling or quadrupling inventory from either new builds or distressed homeowners. So this leaves current homeowners needing to sell. Now, everything relies on the economy, and I mean everything. If the economy was to tank, then we'll definitely see more homeowners look to sell their property in order to protect the equity that they've made rather than allow for the bank to take it. But I don't see that level being so out of balance where it makes our inventory quadruple. That would need to be a major, major economic event. Like grab your helmet and pray economic or world event. One where you aren't necessarily worried about the equity that you have parked in your house. I also have not heard anyone talk about this and there is zero data, but I think there is an additional unspoken market dynamic that really needs to be considered. It's all about the homeowners that are locked into their homes with historical low interest rates. They're not gonna have the same motivation to step up to a new and larger home while interest rates remain high. This is then going to restrict the supply and this restriction of supply, I believe, could make up for any additional supply that comes to the market from distressed sales. 
I believe that homeowners that are locked into their good deals, they're going to stay in their houses longer and are going to be more apt to stick it out until they're busting at the seams or might be more inclined to do an add-on uh, addition to their current home. And I say this from personal experiences. I look at my own personal situation and this is exactly what my wife and I are planning on doing. If there's not going to be any huge change in supply, then we would need a huge change from the demand side of the equation in order for there to be more than a market balance, but an imbalance to trigger that home price depreciation and a crash. Now, what would have to happen in order to get demand to shrink to such an extreme level? A worldwide pandemic? Oh wait, that won't actually happen and demand and prices actually skyrocketed. So we can cross that one off the list of possibilities. The only way demand shrinks is based off an economic shock from the pain inflicted from increasing interest rates. Now, interest rates, they're not tied to the federal funds rate. I know that I've said this a ton of times, but it's really important to know. The rates are, however, influenced by them. In other words, just because the Fed increases that benchmark rate by 100 basis points, that does not mean mortgage rates are going to go up 1%. A better correlation for interest rates is actually looking at the 10-year treasury bond. Now, the 10-year treasury bond yields are set through a bidding process. When confidence is high, prices for the bond drop and yields rise. When confidence is low, it works the other way. So now that we understand the mechanics, what type of interest rate shock would it take to get mortgage rates to rise to a point where it would halt the Massachusetts real estate market? It's a really great question and one that I quite frankly don't have a firm answer for. It is estimated that housing contributes somewhere around 15 to 18% of our total gross domestic product. So as interest rates go up to battle inflation, it's going to slow the growth of the economy. That is the entire point of increasing interest rates. This reduction in growth will affect jobs and consumer spending and thereby home sales. And there is your tailspin as housing is 15 to 18% of all economic output. Now, what I can say is that I don't see interest rates going up to the 15 to 18% like we saw in the early 80s. According to a housing survey released by the New York Federal Reserve, they anticipate interest rates to reach 6.7% by the end of the year and 8.2% by 2025. Others, including the National Association of Realtors, believe that we will start to see rates go down toward the end of 2023 and stabilize around 5.5%. The Mortgage Bankers Association expects rates to average 4.8% by the end of this year and decrease to an average of 4.6% by 2024. I personally believe that interest rates will be higher than the National Association of Realtors and MBA organizations are touting, but no one truly knows. They're all just guesses. But what we do know is that the Fed, they're gonna keep increasing interest rates until inflation is squashed. And they need to do this quickly. Once they squash inflation, that's when they're gonna start easing slowly to start stimulating the economy and ultimately take us out of that recession. And speaking of inflation, would you believe me if I told you that inflation could actually help the fundamentals of the real estate market? Wait, what? Yes. If home prices start leveling off, not going down, leveling off and wage growth continues for even a short period of time, then that will help the affordability index that we actually spoke about earlier. In a way, housing will become less expensive if housing prices level off and if wage growth continues through the devaluation of the dollar. We saw this in the home value to earnings ratio in Worcester, which we had talked about earlier. Now back to the million dollar question, will home prices in Massachusetts crash? No. I just don't see it in the current economic environment that we're currently in. I do, however, believe there will be some markets then then that end up giving some of their gains back. But I do not believe that most towns in Massachusetts will have a price correction. Which markets, you ask? I'd say that the markets that saw 20% or more appreciation each year over the last couple years are the ones that are most likely to see some pricing corrections. But as I said earlier, it really is all based on the economy. How bad of a recession are we gonna go into? Will the Fed need to be more aggressive or go beyond the 2023 timeline that they're currently citing? But even then, those are national metrics. What happens in our local economy and how strong will it stay is the question of whether it will be able to weather the storm. Which industry is most impacted? Is it technology, manufacturing? Our state's exposure to some industries is less than others. So today's unemployment rate in Massachusetts is 3.8% compared to the unemployment rate of 4.5% in 2007. 
I believe that the Massachusetts economy is a pretty diverse economy with healthcare, biotech, technology, manufacturing, finance, education, and a strong service economy. I continue to believe that this diversity of industries is going to help us better perform than many other areas that are solely reliant on one type of industry. And with this talk about a recession, I think it is again important to mention that the 2008 recession was a housing caused recession. It makes sense that the asset class that started the recession is ultimately the one that bears the biggest brunt of an asset correction. It's also important to remember that a recession and decreased housing prices do not necessarily correlate. As a matter of fact, we've actually only seen home prices go down twice in the last five recessions, once in 2008 and the other time was in 1991. Now we all know what happened back in 2008, but the other housing price recession was only a correction of 1.9%. Not exactly earth shattering. And I don't pretend to be the smartest guy in the room and I'm always trying to look at history in order to gauge where the future is headed. And everyone always jumps to 2008 because quite frankly, that is the last historic memory they have. It just so happens that that is actually the recent historic memory that happens to be the, wor the real estate's worst economic episode. That was a triple A credit rating event that historically it only happens once in a lifetime. The last time a triple A event like that happened was in the Great Depression. And historically speaking, we shouldn't see another one of those in our lifetime. Comparing our data today to that of 2005 through 2008, there are not a lot of similarities. Our inventory is low and the decreases in seller supply, they've gone toe to toe with that decrease in buyer demand. Like I said earlier, from where I'm sitting right now, I just don't see any economic events that's gonna shock the market to an extent where it forces a flood of inventory that comes to the market. And that's in our market. Again, this is a video that talks specifically about Massachusetts home values in the Massachusetts market. There are other markets around the United States that I believe are quite frankly, well, screwed. In markets that saw 30%, 40%, 50% year over year appreciation growth, and markets that saw huge institutional buying like Atlanta, Phoenix, and Charlotte, if that's you, then I believe you're in for a rough ride. Houses, for example, that were in the market in Florida for a million dollars pre-COVID and just recently sold for $4 million that are second homes nonetheless. Well, you could be in for a bumpy ride. But in Massachusetts, our market fundamentals are strong. And as I said earlier, I believe there will be markets in our state that do have a slight pricing correction. But for the most part, my prediction is that we will see market prices stabilize in the zero to 3% appreciation range. Some, they're gonna perform better. Others, they're gonna perform worse. But it's my opinion that all will outperform the equity markets. And to that point, I believe that the real estate asset class will be one of the best performing asset classes in the next couple of years. And I know it's going to be one of the best long term performing asset classes. I'd actually recommend to take a look at this video that I did that compares a $50,000 investment made in the stock market versus one made in real estate in the year 2000 and see what happens in the next 20 years that that money is put to work with the average uh, uh, gains in the markets. I'm also gonna mention that the 2008 pricing correction was even in this time period, and even with that, the returns are still eye-opening and just incredible for real estate. If you're wanting to build wealth, then there is no better investment than real estate, period. Do you have any questions or comments about the market data and the market conditions? Then throw them in the comments section below. If you want to talk about your own personal real estate needs and your personal real estate goals, then find my information in that description below as well. I'd love to chat with you because I love talking real estate. And can you do me a huge favor? Can you please hit that like and subscribe button? And if you could please share this information with your friends and family members who are either thinking about making a move or just curious about the market data and ultimately their largest investment, then I would be truly appreciative. Again, my name is Jeffrey Chubb with the Chubb Homes team. Until next time.